Thanks for being here. I really, truly mean that, especially this week. I'm glad to see you came back. You're here. Just a reminder, if you didn't pick up on that, July 4th, next weekend, July 3rd, we will not be having church here. But if you show up, the doors will be locked, but you can sit in the parking lot, play Duck, Duck, Goose, sing some worship songs. Somebody can preach, but I will not be here. But you are welcome to use the parking lot all you want. This week, um, you know, I've been back from vacation now for a week and a half, I guess, or so. And on vacation, we, we did a lot of activities like hiking and snorkeling and swimming. And so I felt like I was getting a lot of exercise. While we were there, too, though, you know, because we're eating pretty rich, you know, during that time. And so I thought I should get some other exercise as well. So Karen and I did go to the gym. Um, she did Jordan's workout. Jordan was texting her. And, you know, she's doing her little, it's crazy, man. It's a, it's a hard workout. I'm watching her. I'm just lifting weights, and I didn't put very heavy weights on because I'm on vacation. So I worked out, but it, you know, it was kind of a lighter workout. Uh, this week, though, Monday, I'm like, time to get back to the gym, time to, to put the heavy weights on the rack. And so I go to the gym, and my weights aren't all that heavy, but, you know, 245 bench pressing, I don't even know what that is, but I'm doing that. I'm doing a lot of heavier weights at the gym, and, you know, I'm like, oh, this is hard. I haven't done this for a long time, and, and it kicked my butt. And, you know, lifting heavy weights and getting back into the swing of things, it, it was tough. And so by the time I left the gym on Monday, I walked out in the parking lot, and kid you not, I wandered around for 10 minutes and could not find my car because of how how tired I was from being at the gym. I'm sure I look like an idiot, you know, up and down the aisles trying to find my little white car. If I went to the gym every day and all I did was lift really light weights, I mean, the, the lightest I could push up and, and really didn't push myself or challenge myself a lot, it'd be kind of pointless because there would ever, ever, never be any gains. There would be no growth if I'm just, you know, lifting Campbell soup cans or whatever every day at the gym. We're in a new series. We started it last week. This is week two. It's difficult questions. And throughout this series, I've committed to you that it's going to be some heavy lifting. It's going to be some weeks where, where the sermon or the topic or, or whatever might kick our butts a little bit. We're going to walk out of here maybe a little disoriented and there'll be some soreness through the week. But I encourage you, hang in there, stick with it, because there will also be growth. And that applies anytime you go into God's Word. You can do the light stuff, and you can just, you know, touch the surface a little bit. But if you're going to go deep, and if you're going to lift heavy, there might be some soreness and some disorientation, but that's how you grow. And so our question this week, it won't be as heavy and as, as kind, of, kind of deep as, as last week. It's, it's a different kind of question, and I'm going to keep it a little lighter, and maybe even a little more fun, because last week was heavy. Um, it's, the question this week is, the rules of the Bible, the laws of the Bible that we find in Scripture, which ones are valid? Like, do we need to follow all the laws of the Bible, or do we need to just follow some of them? And if you're in the some of them category, how do we pick which laws of the Bible that we actually fall? And I know there may be some here or some listing out in virtual land that, that are saying right now, well, Brian, it's really easy. The Bible is 100% truth. You cannot cherry pick which laws or which rules that you want to follow. They'll quote to me 2 Timothy 3.16, which is actually one of my favorite scriptures. It's all scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that's us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is God-breathed, it's useful, and it's equipping us for every good work. But these people that would quote that verse and, you know, do the, can't cherry pick your, your laws or your rules, they also are people who cherry pick what laws and rules they follow from the Bible. Let me give you an example. Leviticus 20, verse 9. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Now, last I checked, I haven't had anyone pushing their church to be more biblical because we haven't put to death in our congregations the people who speak poorly about their parents. We'd have no kids in our children ministry if that was the case. In fact, if we're going to go the literal route of, you know, everything is, is 100%, you got to do what the Bible says, there's going to be a lot of people beginning to die around us. <laughs> 
Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Now, in my insurance agency, I've mentioned this before, we have a rule that if you cheat on your spouse, you're fired. I tell people that the day they're hired, or I at least attempt to tell people that the day they're hired, because I want them to know, if you're going to cheat on the person you love the most, I don't trust you not to cheat on me, so you can't work here. And I've actually been challenged on that in a mediation, saying that's not a legal reason to fire somebody. It is. Florida's an at-will uh, employment state. But the Bible says, nah, firing them's not enough. You need to kill that person if they cheat on their spouse spouse. Deuteronomy 13.5, I don't have a verse for this one, Peyton, but basically it says if someone tries to turn you away from your God, Yahweh, they must be put to death. So that means we need to genocide the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and anybody who's not a Christian. Deuteronomy 13.12 says if there is a city worshiping a different God than the God of the Bible, they should be put to death. Which, again, if we follow that literally, a 9-11 style attack would be justifiable on any city that did not believe in God. There are 613, give or take, laws in the Old Testament. And I want to make it clear, we all pick and choose. Now, most of us know about the food laws of the Old Testament, you know, no pork, no shellfish. Here's another one, though, maybe you didn't know. Leviticus 3.17, you must never eat any fat or blood. This is a not a temporary law, this is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. No cooking with bacon fat, and that's the secret ingredient to my mac and cheese, and it's good, so that's a real bummer. No medium rare steaks. I mean, I know where we grew up, it's in the country, and people didn't eat medium rare. We did. People didn't eat medium rare. It was either well done, well done, well, well done, or well, well, well done. That was the variety of the steaks we had where we grew up. If you go to the Old Testament and read it, and you should be, it's a deep rabbit hole, and you're going to want to skip over all these laws. I'll give you a few more. Don't trim the hair on the sides of your heads. Let it grow. If you've seen the curly cues, Orthodox Jews, that's where they get that from. Or clip off the edges of your beard, which if you have edges to a beard that you can't clip off, it means we all need to have beards, which I like that law. That's fine. It says, um, those with flat noses can't go to the altar of God. <laughs> Don't know what your nose looks like. Um, no, we talked about this actually in the story of the birth of Jesus, that Mary took a while to go to the temple because if you give birth to a baby boy, you got 33 days you have to wait before you're allowed to go to temple. It's 66 days for a girl. I found this one, no crossbreeding of animals. That means those labradoodles or doodles you have at home are, are a violation of scripture. Uh, no marrying anyone who is divorced. So if you get a divorce, you've got to be single forever. No working on the Sabbath, and you have to think about what constitutes work and also that the Sabbath is, is Friday at sundown to Saturday, so that's a whole nother thing. No selling land permanently. So whatever you buy, the land your house sits on, you got to stay there. You can't upgrade, downgrade. you got to keep with that. No clothes made of mixed materials. So the tri-blend t-shirts that I love, you cannot have those. And there's a lot of rules about women on their periods. You can't touch her. You can't sit where she sat. Men, if they have sex with their wife, they have to be cut off, both of them, from the community, which I don't even know how the community would know about whether or not they did that. <laughs> there's also things in the Old Testament and New Testament the Bible doesn't denounce, which it doesn't say don't do it, which is weird. Polygamy is all over Scripture, and the Bible never denounces it. Slavery is all over Scripture. It's never denounced which some people say, well, if it's not denouncing, I guess it's advocating. And so if we say that God wants us to literally follow all the rules in the Bible, we kind of back ourselves into a bit of a corner. But some will say, and, and this is generally how I've heard it taught, some will say, well, you see, there's three different types of laws in the Old Testament. There's ceremonial laws, and so that's the, the rituals and the traditions and the things that kind of govern their, their worship in the temple. And then there were the civil laws, just like we have speeding laws and, you know, other laws of the land. They had laws that were civil laws that governed Israel. And then in the Old Testament, there are moral laws. And they would say that those moral laws are the ones we must follow. But there's a couple of problems with that. One, people don't agree on which ones fit which category. But number two, and more importantly, in the Bible, nowhere, there is no distinction found for those three different types of laws. We've made up those distinctions. And it's convenient, and maybe it's even helpful, 
but we're still imposing some of our own context upon uh, the values and the beliefs of Scripture. We're still picking and choosing. Now, some will say, okay, let's boil this down. Let's just take the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, that's the part we keep, and all the stuff that was mentioned in the New Testament, because that's the New Covenant. So we got the Ten Commandments, and we got the New Testament. And again, that method is never prescribed in Scripture, but even then, if we say that's the route we're going to go, most of us, not all of us, but most of us still cherry pick. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 says, Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Great, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. So no braiding your hair, no gold, no pearls. And of course, somebody will say, well, well, Paul's just using an example. He's not prohibiting the wearing of jewelry or the braiding of your pigtails. He's, he's teaching a principle. Oh, teaching a principle. So the principle here would be what? Not trying to draw attention to yourself. Or I think in, in this case, it's, it's for proper attire for worship. So it would be like me saying, guys, you can wear whatever you want here, just not your bathing suit. You know, that would be not proper attire for our service time. Paul says again in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. A lot of churches really grasp that one and, and tie into it there. And then they, got, they forget this part, though, that rather she is to remain quiet. So you ladies, no laughing, no talking, no speaking. <laughs> and I know, I know you're saying, well, let's be reasonable. Let's be reasonable. The Bible is clear that a woman shouldn't teach, of course, but let's not get crazy and not allow them to talk. And I see what we're doing, again, is we're picking and we're choosing. 1 Corinthians 11, 4 through 6 says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Scott, you had a hat on earlier. No, somebody. Kenny had the hat on earlier. Kenny, dishonoring God with that hat right now. <laughs> but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So you women should all have hats on since it is the same as if her head was shaven. And I've, I've done all the mental gymnastics to work around that, in fact, and talk about being contextual and talk about, you know, that being a first century thing. Or, you know, some will say it's an authority thing that, that you know, hats and whatever were about positions of authority. And I, this is me generally. I know I've preached on it before. I said, let's contextualize this to a period of time. Us taking it literally would be like someone 2,000 years from now listening to one of my sermons and saying, well... Per August 2020, it's a literal law that you must wear a mask anytime you attend church. It'd be like carrying that law forward when it was related to a specific point in time. My point in this exercise is that we all pick and choose from Scripture. Even those who claim to read the Bible literally. Six-day literal creation. Noah lived to be 900 years old. There's giants walking the earth. Dinosaurs never existed. Even those people that are 100% literal... Ignore rules in the Bible. Now, I know, I, I don't see anybody right now, but I know in your head there's somebody raising their hand. You're that kid in class. You're like, me, me, I know the answer, I know the answer. Teacher, call on me. You go to Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, this is the Pharisees asking Jesus, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. When I was a new Christian, Man, that was my, I didn't know a lot of scripture, but I memorized that one quickly. That was, my, that was my kiss verse, the keep it simple, stupid Bible verse. If I can't figure anything else, this is it. Love God, love others. And sometimes, for good effect, I'd even add in that Bible verse that like every high school graduate that graduates from a Christian school has it as their favorite Bible verse. It's Micah 6, 8. It's the only time we quote Micah. And what does the Lord require of you? It says to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And I've preached those. And I've taught, man, Christianity is so simple. Why do we make it so hard? Love God, love people, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly, mic drop. That's it. There's another important verse that follows that love God, love others command, and we tend to skip it or, or just breeze past it. 
It says, love God, love others. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus doesn't say these new commands, love God, love others, replace these laws over here. He says these new commands, everything, the entirety of the law depends upon, it hangs upon these two laws. But we do learn something here, that the purpose of any law that we read in Scripture, no matter if it's the hair thing or the this or the way to worship, it's the purpose of any law ever given by God to us, or to the people of Israel, is to show our love for God. So if you learn nothing else tonight, the purpose of the rules of Scripture, the purpose of the law, is to show our love for God. I've been a student of the Bible for a long time, and I'll tell you, interpreting the Bible is hard. And I hope tonight we can start at a point, as we get into this, that we can just be honest that the Bible is hard. It's got strange language. It's got strange customs. There are jokes in Scripture that we do not get. There are thousands of years of separation between us and the writers. We aren't tribal people wandering through the desert, and we're trying to read stuff written to a tribal nation. We aren't part of the Greco-Roman culture of the New Testament. And then you add to this, we all bring our own experiences and our own biases into the reading, and then we attempt to filter our reading through our own existing belief systems, read a, a thing this week about confirmation bias and, and the definition they get of, of confirmation bias is this tendency to search for, interpret, and favor, and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values. And that's how we often want to approach Scripture. We like simple. We like simple explanations that fit our preferred narrative. And then, mix into all of this study of Scripture, we all have different IQs, we all have different personalities, we all know that our culture plays a huge role in how we interpret Scripture, because somebody in America might interpret something in Scripture completely different than someone in Africa. And this is why we all pick and choose. And tonight, if you don't think I'm talking to you about being somebody who picks and chooses, you're especially the person I'm talking to. But this admission... That confession of our frustration with Scripture, of our own ignorance and biases, is a fantastic first step in approaching this difficult question tonight. The Bible is our most important source of truth, and it's our most important source of wisdom. It is the inspired Word of God. It's God revealing Himself. But the Bible is not God. The Bible is not the fourth member of the Trinity, no matter how much we want to make it that. The Bible is not even a book. It's a library of books written by inspired yet broken human beings living in a fallen culture. And so go with me a little bit here. Can we agree that the Bible is not a rule book? It's not its purpose. The Bible is not a very good history book. The Bible is not a very good book about biology or geology. It's not an instruction manual on how you need to be a good person. The Bible at its heart is a story. It's a very simple story that human beings aren't very good at keeping rules. That's why we need Jesus who kept every rule perfectly. And so our question tonight, what rules must we follow? I think a better question would be is, what is the purpose of the rules that we follow? And I hinted to that earlier. We sang it in the very first song, the doxology, which is the oldest Christian song known. It's the purpose of the rules is praise God from whom all blessings flow. Our obedience is praising God. Our obedience, our following of the rules is an act of worship. It's loving God. That's why working through these questions, and I took some of them kind of lightly, but that's why it's so important. To understand that these questions, these laws in the Bible, is not about a checklist on how we get to heaven, that if you have faith in Christ, your salvation is secure. An important note, and we need to keep this in mind, that the law, the, the rules of Scripture, wasn't given until God rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. I don't know if you realize that. There are no real rules. I mean, don't eat the fruit and some of that stuff over here. But the law never came into being until God rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. That order is important, that the law 
comes first. And that the law doesn't save us. God saves us first. And then our obedience is always a response to having been saved. To knowing what Christ has done for us. Motivating us to want to know him more. Wanting us to abandon our false gods. Wanting our lives to please God. To honor God. To give praise to the one from whom all blessings flow. And so... Please, tonight, don't hear me really making light of the rules of the Bible, even though some of them are out there. That's why I use them to point them out to start tonight. And definitely don't hear me saying that the law is not important because it absolutely is important. I'm saying just the opposite. We need to stop trying to use the law to prove our morality to God and to surrender to Jesus, accept his grace, die to our self-righteousness, and then like a curious little child that we talked about last week, we go to God's word and we seek how to praise and give thanks to God through the rules of the Bible. My youngest child, Emery, she's nine years old, and it seems this past couple of weeks since we've been home, she has discovered Legos. And she's played with them before, but man, she is really into Legos now, and, and she's building everything under the sun. We get her kits, and she's supposed to build the thing of the kits, but she ends up doing all kinds of different things to them. Today we found her, she actually glued some of them to a board, so I don't think that's the proper... <laughs> use of them. <laughs> but Legos, let's, you know, you get these little blocks and you build a little house. I've even bought a set for myself. It's a Frank Lloyd Wright. I think it was the Falling Waters house. And I, I built the, the little Lego architecture set. And it was kind of fun to build. But it would be easier and certainly cheaper because Legos are not cheap to just buy a little house model or buy the little things, Eiffel Towers or whatever we're building out of Legos. But she enjoys the building part of the process. She enjoys figuring out the end product. And when she gets to the end and she builds her little thing, she's so proud of it. She wants to come show me her dad or show her mom, look at this thing that I built. And she's got this real sense of accomplishment. And so there's more value for her building that end result versus just buying some prefab little house that you shit on a shelf. We'd all like the Bible to be more clear. I think we can all admit that. But God doesn't give us an answer for everything because everything that comes up in our life, one can't be accounted for. But he's inviting us to be a part of the building process of figuring out these laws. He wants us to take ownership of the law. He wants us to use the pieces of the law that we find in Scripture, and the rules and ethics, and use them for our lives. And so let me be just crystal clear because I know I'll get emails later. I'm not saying we get to invent truth. Let me say it again. I'm not saying we get to invent the truth. I'm saying we get to go to Scripture and we get to seek the truth as we use it to build wisdom for our lives. There are large portions of the Bible that aren't trying to tell us anything other than to move the story along and to give us some context. We don't have to apply every little piece of Scripture into some kind of law. We don't have to draw a moral conclusion from every story in the Bible. The Bible is not Aesop's fables, where you read a story and, wow, that story, let me draw this moral conclusion. We can't, preachers, we do that all the time. We take a story, Jacob and Esau, and we, we get some moral conclusions. But that's okay to do that, but understand that's not the purpose of the Bible. But we can read every page of the Bible, every verse, every word, every story, and we can glean wisdom. And so when we see some of those ceremonial laws that are just so tedious, we're like, what? Man, I hate reading Leviticus because this is over and over. You do this with the meat and do that with the meat and don't do that. And, do that, and you're just reading it you're like, what do I do with this? But you can read that and you can take away God's people are supposed to be holy in whatever way in our culture that holiness looks like. That when we start looking like everyone else around us, that's God's not, God, not God's intent, and we're probably on the right track, wrong track. And so when we read the scripture and we go into the laws, it's not about being a legalist and saying, got to follow every letter of every law. I think it's about seeking the law's intent. And as I thought about it this week, I thought about our own Supreme Court, which is probably not a great illustration or comparison. But those who sit on the Supreme Court are placed there not to rewrite the Constitution, 
The Supreme Court never rewrites the Constitution. They interpret it. They take a 200-year-old document, and they take that document, and they apply that to modern times and modern circumstances that come up. That's how we should handle God's Word. Legos come in all shapes and sizes. There's the, you know, when I was a kid, man, you got like three different blocks, like the six block, the four block, and the two block. But now they got everything under the sun. Lego Master, I don't know if you've seen that on Fox, but man, they're building some crazy stuff really out of Legos. And so there's just all these different shapes and sizes and pieces. And it's interesting, the more pieces and the more shapes and the more sizes that you use, it allows you to build something of more interest. There's more variety, which gives a better result. And so wisdom, is the word I'm going to hit on a bunch, comes from a variety of sources. I'm going to preach maybe in a few weeks about common grace, so that's another sermon. But the concept is that wisdom can come from a variety of sources. And so everything we read, every experience we have in life, both our past and our present, our community, our traditions, those who have come before us, those who have studied topics deeply that can teach us insights to our own minds and personalities, all of that can help build wisdom. And more we bring that into our building process, the greater our ability to apply God's law to our lives for his glory. So I was going to do a whole separate sermon on the inconsistencies of Scripture. And I just, I don't want to go too far down this path, so I just thought I'd include it and build it into this sermon tonight. But I don't know if you realize, you will realize that if you've read Scripture, and if you haven't, maybe you don't know these are there, but there are a lot of inconsistencies in Scripture, and that brings some difficultness when we study Scripture, and of course those outside the church will use that to say why the Bible's not true and all of that. But the Bible sometimes contradicts itself. And the first time you come across that, and if I'm, I'm telling you this for the first time tonight, you might have some soreness and some disorientation when you leave. But normally we think for a law to work... There needs to be consistency. If we had a law that said red usually means stop, that wouldn't work very well as a law. There needs to be consistency. Red always means stop. But we see inconsistencies in the Bible, and not just the stories of the Bible. We've got the four Gospels, and they tell stories differently, and that's an inconsistency, but also inconsistencies in God's law itself. One book to the next. And I'll give you just a couple of examples to illustrate. The question is, can Israelites eat the carcasses of mauled animals? If you read Exodus and Deuteronomy, both of them say, no, you're a holy people and that's gross. (laughs) Don't eat the carcasses of animals. But then you turn over to Leviticus and it says, sure, but you'll be unclean until evening and be sure to wash your clothes. Two books apart, and we're getting inconsistencies. Can Israelites keep their fellow Israelites as slaves? If you go to the book of Exodus, it says yes, but the males can choose freedom after six years. If you go to the book of Deuteronomy, it says yes, but both male and females can choose freedom after six years. If you go to the book of Leviticus, no way, no how, you should never enslave each other. This is God's word. It's holy. It's inspired And yet we see inconsistencies like this all over. Why? Why would God allow that in his divine word? I think in part it's a reminder that the Bible is not God, that it is fully inspired by God, but also fully written by human authors. But more so, I think what if the inconsistencies are there to make us have to work through the stuff and really process it? Let me give you another inconsistency to explain what I mean. In the Old Testament, I read it earlier, it says long hair is good. In fact, it's a command. You heard me read, don't, don't cut the sides of your hair. So long hair is good. If you go to the story of Samson, you know, his long hair is where he gets his strength. So Old Testament, long hair good. You go to the New Testament, Paul writes that long hair is shameful for men. And so now you've got a contradiction in Scripture. But a lesson then, if we say, well, why is that? And we study it and we ponder it and we meditate upon it, is that cultural norms can play a part in our application of Scripture. Let me give you an even more blatant one here in the book of Proverbs, which is the book of wisdom. Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you will become as foolish as they are. Verse 5. Be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools, or they will become wise in their own estimation. 
One verse to the next seems like a contradiction. Certainly an F for grammar if you're grading this, this book. But both of those can be true statements depending upon the situation. It's a situational component of the law. And here's why. At least the conclusion I've come to. The Bible can't give you a rule for every situation in life that could possibly come up. And even if it could, no way we could remember them all. you got to remember, we only had Google the last 20 years or so. People couldn't Google the answers for the last 2,000 years. So, in your life, isn't wisdom better than a list of laws? Shouldn't wisdom from the laws be our goal? To look at the law's intent, to think, to discern, to ponder, to reflect, to then argue with the rules. Not as an act of rebellion against God, but actually just the opposite of an act of worship and hanging out with our Father. If we approach the Bible as this one-size-fit-all, how-to-be-a-good-Christian instruction manual, we're not going to find wisdom. We're not going to even find a step-by-step guide for all the decisions that we have to make every single day, most of them on the fly as we move along. But if we can grasp the big ideas, and that's not quick, and that's not easy, of all of these laws, and apply the wisdom of those laws, then the Bible can equip us thoroughly for every good work. And so I'm just going to give a couple of examples of how you can do this because we don't have a service here next week. And so I think you got two weeks now to study some scripture. And so I'm going to encourage you not to read the book of John. I'm going to encourage you to take some scripture or some law or some section that, that you just don't know about or you're struggling with and you just you don't know and, and study it and discern it and think about it and see what wisdom can come out of that. So let me give you an example of, of how to do that. I'm going to talk about the tattoo rule because a lot of people throw that in my face for obvious reasons. Leviticus 19.28, do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. It's a pretty serious statement and at first glance it seems pretty straightforward. That's why I've had more than one person even giving blood the other day. Somebody said, hey, you know the Bible says you're not supposed to have those tattoos and had to have the whole conversation, and she was very well intending. But what do we do? How do we approach a text like this? Well, number one, we come to that text, and we need to be open to change. That means when I read that text, I need to be aware that I have a confirmation bias, that I want to read that text, and I want it to tell me that it's okay for my existing beliefs that I have tattoos everywhere. And then... I need to pray. I need to invite the Spirit into my time of study. That is so critical. And then we all have curiosity. We're all little kids at heart, and so we need to bring that curiosity into our study time. What does not having a tattoo do with the purpose of the law, which is to love God and to love others? And so we go to the context and we go to the culture. If you do that, you'll learn that historically, tattoos were part of the pagan worship practices. This was true for the Canaanites. They were the enemies of the Jewish people. And so if Israelites marked their bodies with tattoos, it was a signal to everyone around them that they also participated in Canaanite-style worship. Let me give you a modern comparison of what it would be like. It'd be like a Christian walking around with a t-shirt with the number 666 on it. That imagery would be inconsistent with our beliefs and confusing to those around us. And so then we start to draw some conclusions. It's not about ink on the skin. It's about who or what it might associate me with. And then we take that and we do a personal application. Well, if I'm going to have tattoos, maybe I get ones that point people to Jesus. And maybe that'll give me an opportunity to share the Gospels or others can relate to me better because I'm not, you know, whatever, Ned Flanders or whatever. (laughs) And then, that's not the end, I need to be fully aware and open and convicted, open to being convicted, that I might be wrong. And that I might have to painfully someday have all these tattoos removed from my body. Let's do another one. Let's go to Ephesians 5.18. Pretty straightforward. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. 
pretty clear. It makes pretty good sense, right? Don't get drunk. It'll make you do a lot of dumb stuff. A lot of dumb stuff that's not very God-honoring. Getting drunk leads to alcoholism. Alcoholism leads to a lot of ruined lives. We know that very well in this church. And so a biblical literalist, number one, the first one, he's over here and he's going to say, the Bible says, don't get drunk. That means never, ever have a drink, ever. Bible literalist number two over here says, it's not how I read it. It says, do not get drunk on wine. <laughs> Beer must be okay. Jaeger bombs until I puke must be okay because the Bible is silent on those. But then you got number three over here, which is I hope who you guys are. It's the wisdom interpretator. And they look at this verse and we're like, I don't think that's about the wine. I think it's about doing anything, anything that takes away our ability to make good decisions. Anything that takes away our ability to witness the gospel. Anything that takes away our ability to give glory. Anything that can become an idol and replace God in our lives. Do you see the difference? And if we're really approaching that verse for true wisdom, and this is my real challenge to you as you do this over the next two weeks, that ought to push you to some even deeper questions like, what's happening around us now? Do you know the most consumed psychoactive drug in the world? Caffeine. Does consuming coffee break God's law? No, 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 oh, yeah, no way. No. <laughs> now, I grew up Mormon. They said yes. If you ask them why, they have no idea, but they just say it does because <laughs> God told Joseph Smith, and that's what they tell us. If you ask Christians, you're like, heck no, that's why we have a coffee shop in our lobby. That's the thing. So we need to apply some wisdom to this law. And we say, well, how does it apply to coffee? It is a psychoactive drug, and so it, it can be addicting. It could be a problem. It could cause us to spend money that we don't have. And so we've got a $200 a month Starbucks bill, and we don't give a dime to our church. And as we build tolerance, we find more sources of caffeine, and so we start drinking Coke and Monster drinks, and they got sugar and now there's health consequences, and it can raise your blood pressure, and so maybe the conclusion you come to is, eh, okay, but moderation is key, and, and you apply all the same things that you did to beer and wine. It's how wisdom works. You take this, you say, this is the law. What's the wisdom in the law? Let's take it a step further, because we're going down this path tonight. What about marijuana? I mean, no matter how much you do or don't want it to be legal, it's, <laughs> it's coming soon. I thought you all would appreciate that, a handful of you would anyway. Bob Ross, pretty little trees, now we know why. <laughs> Bible doesn't say not to smoke pot, so must be okay. Bible also doesn't say not to eat cardboard, but it doesn't mean that eating cardboard is good for you. And so we got to work through it with wisdom, and we look at our lives, and we talk to those in community around us. Pastor, what do you think? Friend who I'm in a Bible study with, what do you think? And so maybe what would come out is, well, the Bible says we got to obey the law of the land, so it's pretty clear right now. The Bible says we got to love others, and cartels are very bad, and that's where it's coming from if it's not legal. So if pot's not legal and it's coming from the cartels, don't smoke it. That, that's pretty clear looking at Scripture. What about, what about medical reasons? Oh, well, it's legal now for medical. An easy case can be made that, that it's better than some of the other drugs that are being prescribed, so, so perhaps. But we all know this is coming, the recreational use of pot. And those of you who, who are saying it's okay to have you know, six or seven beers, you've got no legs to stand on to make an argument against this. But the rest of us may say, well, you know, the drunk effect from marijuana is pretty instantaneous. And so that could be a problem with this substance. And never mind that it's a gateway drug. And you can continue down this argument. And I'm not here tonight preaching on the pros and cons of smoking pot or whether or not it's God-honoring. That's not the purpose of this little exercise. What I want you to see is how God's word has to mix with the world around us that our ethics are going to play a part of it, that our current scientific knowledge are going to play a part of it, and then we got to approach God's word knowing our own sinful hearts and our confirmation biases. And I know, 
At least for me, I like clarity. God, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. Couldn't you have given us a scripture that said, Thou shalt not smoke pot. You may consume an edible in the amount of 15 grams, so long it is to treat cancer or other non-curable disease, and so long as it's purchased from a government-approved entity, and so long as they're licensed to sell the marijuana, and so long as all profits go to build a church in Africa, then you may smoke pot. But then there would be instances that came up that weren't covered in that verse. Well, they sell pot, and it meets all those things, but the money's going to a church in Guatemala. I'm a literalist, and so we can't, now we can't do it. We need to do the heavy lifting with Scripture. That's my point tonight. We need to read the Bible. I don't know how much I say that in here, but I say it a lot. And we need to read it cover to cover. And we need to read books about the Bible. We need to listen to podcasts about the Bible. And yes, we need to study our history, not just in the Bible, but of culture. And we need to pay attention to the world around us and be alert. And we need to lean into the Spirit as we do all that. And we need to be praying. And maybe you should even come to church once in a while and hear a preacher preach. And you need to get in community in that church with your fellow believers and not be afraid to disagree from time to time with them and still be a community. By the way, we're working on a plan to get you guys in better community outside of here. Stay tuned for details in a couple of weeks on that. I think you'll like it and pretty excited about it. So let me ask the band to come up because I do want to finish giving God praise, praising the one from whom all blessings flow. Let me go to my, my Bible verse that I was in love with when I started and I still love as a Christian. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We've got to take that and wrap that around everything that we do. But is it a keep it simple, stupid Bible verse? Well, it's not, really, because there is enormous complexity in attempting to figure out how to love God with our lives and how to love others with our lives. And so I wrote, the greatest commandment will be the greatest challenge of your life. In a rule book, from here to the sun and back, couldn't give you all the answers on how to do that. That's why we need wisdom. That's why we need the Spirit. That's why we need each other. And most of all, it's why we need Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered them saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Law, love God, love others. I don't know about you, but most days when I'm trying to follow that law, I'd give myself a, a C plus probably at best, maybe a B minus on a really good day. Or I might have the tendency to answer, well, I'm doing better than most people. But God doesn't grade on a curve. In fact, God doesn't give grades at all. Life is either pass or it's fail. With the laws of the Bible, there is no nice try. On this, the Bible is very clear. Jesus says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the ultimate law. Paul, though, says we all fail. None is righteous, no, not one. But Jesus is bigger than the law. For those who place their hope in him, we've already passed the test of life before we even try. And once we take hold of that, man, there is tremendous freedom. It removes the self-righteousness on the days where I think I'm getting it right, and it removes the guilt and shame on the days when I know I've gotten it wrong. And so seek wisdom. Allow God's word to push you, pull you, drag you to the truth because at the end of that road seeking for truth you'll find Jesus saying child of weakness watch and pray and seek but find in me thine all in all won't you stand let's give God praise tonight